Yeah, I'm so glad that any pictures of myself in Obama sweatshirt does not survive to this <laughs> current day. Happy Black History Month. And my apologies to uh, our listeners because I'm severely running on colored people time. I promise you that, okay, so I'm going to make a, a, for a disclaimer here. At the time of this recording, I still haven't finished editing my December episode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's beyond lazy. Oh, no. You got to just lynch this guy. Yeah, see, th this is the thing too where sometimes I wish I was born white so that I don't get to use colored people time as an excuse. But then again, that means I will, won't have freedom of speech either. But anyway... Uh, well, let's start off with the most, this is our introductions. The, with the most oppression points is Brandon over here. All right, uh, Brandon, black male, extremely straight. Wakanda forever. Horrible. Um, let's see. Oh, right, conservative. That's going to throw. Hmm? And a federalist, but black federalists, according to the media, does, do not exist. Yeah, I know what's gonna happen when this leaks. Yeah, let's just find a narrative for me. Yeah, let's just tr let's just put in, uh, a stock white guy on your <laughs> on your article. I don't yes. know what they're gonna do about the dreads. Okay, they oh, can yes. figure that out. Oh yeah, and uh, how do you celebrate uh, Black History Month? Oh man, this is gonna be sacrilegious. I mostly don't. Uh, mostly just let white people grovel to me and <laughs> occasionally pull that card out when I need a favor in some social setting. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. And also, as far as so, the Minority Report for those who don't know, it's a podcast of mostly minorities and one token straight white male to discuss culture politics in a mostly non-serious fashion. So our token straight white male guest for today for this right here Black History Month is I'm going to hold up a picture of uh, Sean King uh, to my YouTube viewers. So Sean King, or better known as Talcum X or Martin Luther Cream. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which one is best, but uh, okay. So <laughs> for those who uh, don't know about Sean King, so this guy is the, the whitest of whites. I put him on par with Lizard Warren in terms of whiteness. So he looked completely white. He's basically uh, the male Rachel Dozell. Too. At least Elizabeth Warren came forward with a blood test. <laughs> For no reason. That was such a weird <laughs> hill to die on. It would be better if she just... This, these unforced errors. <laughs> I respect that. She doubled down. I, I don't know if it works, but... Uh... <laughs> My goodness. The only people watering her are Mormons. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the topic for today is how white people, particularly conservatives and liberals, can be better effective in their outreach with the black community. So, Brandon, you're black and you're a conservative, so how... So how do you feel that conservative, white conservatives in particular, are missing the mark when it comes to engaging a black audience, and how do you believe they can improve? Uh, on the conservative end, I think white conservatives make the same mistake that uh, white liberals do. Uh, you can't look at the black community as some hive-minded mass. Right? Yeah, it's not a monolith. Yeah, and most of them still have like that view, so there's just black things they try to sprinkle in that they think will appeal to black people. And really, it's not. Uh, if you're a political party, ultimately what we can boil down to you is what laws you want and what you would get rid of. <clears throat> Those laws either would or would not positively affect black people. That, that's it. Explain why the hell your setup is better. Yeah, that's my... Uh yeah, that's pretty much my experience when it comes to my um, political campaign experience. So I'm a former uh, political operator, and well, we guess I'm semi-retirement. <clears throat> I'm sorry for coughing. So for the viewers who don't know, oh, I didn't even mention myself. So anyway, uh, oh yeah, I forgot. Uh, so a black bandit is Wakanda forever, and Sean King is Wyoming forever. And uh, I'm Chris. I'm your host, who forgets to introduce myself half the time. And because I'm part Chinese, I guess I'm Wuhan forever. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'm I don't have them that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, uh, back to my, yeah, my, in my experience, there's a lot of people from both parties who just write off uh, entire swathes of communities as people not worth fighting for. For example, uh, most of the time I'll be working for Republican, I, I'm working for, I work for Republican campaigns and I'll be dropped off in, for example, rural districts. 
to where I'll talk to voters, say, oh, we vote Republican. Democrats have never came to our door, so we'll just vote Republican. And the same thing happens when I am dropped off in um, inner city minority neighborhoods to where I talk to black voters and they say, oh, this is the first time that a Republican has asked for my votes. <laughs> so, uh, so I concur with your view and go on further to say that a lot of the, a lot of people first, I'll just write out entire communities, as you said, as a vote's not worth fighting for. Mm. But uh, another thing is they're treating them like a monolith to where, uh, I, every, it, identity politics is a controversial subject when it comes to conservative circles. But what, personally, I think identity politics uh, I, can be used effectively, just most of the time it isn't. So it's okay to say, hey, uh, these issues are more likely to matter to this segment of the population. But don't assume that they're going to all hold the same view. Well, um, I think it's being used too effectively now in reference to identity politics. Um, for example, going back to the 2012 election. That was Mitt Romney, right? All right, good. Not eight. Um, the talking point then was all about how Mitt Romney was racist. Mm. And the idea was uh, the black thing to do is don't vote for him. He's not enough like us. He's a guy that grew up kind of privileged, sort of. His dad was like, really, if his dad was running, Obama would have had some real trouble. That guy is like supposed to be the pinnacle of the black experience, right? He was actually born in Mexico, uh, grew up half his childhood in a Mormon colony, had to leave Mexico because of uh, the Mexican Revolution in the early 1900s. <laughs> And, uh, like, Mitt Romney's dad led, like, a real hard American life, educated himself, <clears throat> advanced, and uh, he had that whole experience. And most people don't know that. I didn't know that until last year. Um, most people just know what's in front of them on the TV, what they hear from uh, their equally un... Well, I won't say uneducated, but uh, non-investigative friends who just do that. And that becomes your truth. You, you don't want to dive any more into that. Uh, the average voters are going to go play around on Wikipedia, reading about people's backgrounds and their family histories <coughs> and all that. But uh, even though, literally speaking, that's really what's going to weigh into how that person is going to rule over you, what you're voting for them for. But uh, you really mm -hmm. just look into your little community and what the popular view there is. And even going beyond what's popular, are you a traitor for not doing that? Yeah, that's the thing, too, where your uh, whatever minority label you have, your card can be revoked for stepping out of line. For example, it doesn't even have to be politics. If you're a black person who watches anime and listens to rock and roll instead of hip hop, then your black card is revoked for some uh, unforeseen reason. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully that's fading soon. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, up until very recently, there was just stuff you didn't do if you were black, like... Uh, from about middle school onward, I, I was the black guy that talked white. I, uh, and nowadays, that, that's a funny thing to say, but uh, back then, that, that was a real thing. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. the guy you trot out to talk to the white people. I, uh, I used the big words like them. It was fancy. Oh, yeah. And uh, that whole idea. And I guess the funny thing about that is that's really just a black thing. Other black people tell you that. No. No white person is going to come to me and say, oh, you talk so good, young man, just like us. Very good. <laughs> uh, that's never happened to me in my life. And, uh, you know, I've been in semi-rural Texas this whole time. So uh, yeah. I'd say a lot of the damage is really insular. Probably yeah. the majority. Yeah, a lot of it is insular. Don't worry. I'm not going to blame white people for everything wrong in the world. That will be for my April Fool's episode. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> it's just that... <laughs> But there's, a, there's ways to be effective. For example, there's too many people, uh, I see this online, white conservatives, who talk about, oh, uh, Democrats are the party of slavery, the party of racism, the, they were on the wrong side of the Civil War, and too much. No one really cares in the modern day if they're not even doing a basic internet search of, their t of the top three candidates of, of their of voting records. They're not going to care about to the, what's considered to them ancient history. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a solid point. Uh, like, you can point out all that stuff. It's totally factually correct. Um, like, for example, I think the, like, fact that threw me the most I learned was the first movie in the White House was that Klan movie. I think maybe it's Birth of a Nation. I always mix it up with the Hitler one. <laughs> but um, 
That was the first movie ever screened there. <clears throat> and that president was, for a time, a member of the KKK and a mm-hmm. hardcore Democrat. And the Klan even had a rally at one of the Democratic National Conventions <clears throat> in the uh, early 1900s. And, shoot, the first uh, female senator, and granted she was only senator for a day, was actually Georgian. And she was hardcore, like racist, I didn't even get to explain it. She was the last member of Congress in American history to have also been a slave owner. What? And mind you, this is after 1920 when they could be in the legislature. And she actually advocated for lynching, and it was controversial. Yeah. And it's hard to be controversial back then for being racist, but like she. When the other races are shook, there's, there's some, a, yeah, there's something where yeah. a black guy was accused of something, of uh, I believe hitting his boss. Oh, no. And uh, basically a posse formed. And uh, mind you, this is 1920s Georgia, so they're not uncivilized. And they literally just beat him to death. And she spent a huge amount of her time, politically speaking, for the rest of her life, talking about why that's right, how black people can't help themselves, um, <clears throat> especially when it comes to white women, how white men need to do that stuff and step up. And uh, you can go on about that all day. Most black people's day will be like, oh, man, that's awful. Still voting Democrat, but that's awful. That's back yeah. then. And that's the thing, too, where I just bring up a good point about this being insular. That the I, I'm also uh, for the uh, uh, viewers out there. I put Shonking's face, uh, unfortunately, on the on the holy uh, Bible of the biography of Malcolm X. So, uh, Ma- so a little bit about Malcolm X is that uh, he's going to uh, tie in with this topic is that Malcolm X talks about how he doesn't like that the black community is just so invested in one political party. Mm-hmm. He said, why can't black people, if we're going to be political, he, he didn't like uh, them being involved in politics to begin with, but it's just, if we're going to be political, why can't we ha- get the same treatment that white people do? Uh, Republicans and Democrats fight for the white vote. He says, why can't we Democrats do the same? He says, if you give, if you put the Democrats first, that goes to put you at the back of the bus. Um, I think that's a good point. Definitely agree with everything that man says, but uh, he has some really inspired logic and uh, points. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that was apparent back then, like with uh, when our parents were growing up and when our grandparents were adults in the black community that we really let fall by the wayside while still taking up like the mantle of racism, especially like now, you know, 2020 America. This is basically a wonderland compared to what my grandmother would have grown up in. Um, like the year she gave birth to my dad, she couldn't sit in the front of a friggin' bus. She couldn't look a white man in the eye, and uh, it was still totally cool to call a girl. Nowadays, someone does that to her, I would debatably not even get prosecuted if I punched the dude out. Um, and that's real progress, and... A lot of that is from our own efforts, really. It wasn't some party stepped in to save us. It was a bunch of black people getting in the streets and basically threatening to shut down America. And we made ourselves such a problem. The politically expedient thing to do was just to give in. Um, And the issue that I'm seeing, though, and I want to say it traces from uh, back then, but the earliest example I can find, I'd say, is the Black Panther Party. Um, Just like... (laughs) <laughs> Look at their origin in Oakland, and it's like the perfect, really it's the perfect conservative story of what to do when you're not happy. Um, police are rolling into neighborhoods in California, beating the crap out of uh, young black men and killing them, and there's no real accountability, and it, it's, it's almost impossible back then to really sue the police, and even if you could, that takes serious resources they don't have. So a few guys who had made it into college... <clears throat> just read the freaking uh, California laws and saw that, oh, wait, we can uh, carry loaded guns as long as we uh, don't point them at anybody. And they realized that uh, the defense laws in California say, oh, yeah, if that cop is assaulting somebody, then you can defend that person's life. So they formed bands of uh, basically patrols of men. They realized there were only three ways in and out of that particular neighborhood. So if a police cruiser rolls into one of those three streets... The call goes out. You'd have six or seven guys following that police cruiser. They're going to get out with him. Whatever he does at whatever address he's at, they're watching. And uh, if that guy starts assaulting somebody, kill him. And I'm totally cool with that. Yes. Um, Because 
white or black, I really don't care. That's an yeah, it's, agent of the government. Yeah, it's why we have somebody. the Second Amendment to begin with, to, against, yeah. to, to, prevent, to protect ourselves against tyrannical force. It's not about duck hunting. Yeah, and I'm really proud of that um, origin. And uh, even earlier, and I can't remember the guy's name, but in North Carolina, there's a man who would come back from World War II serving in the Marines, a black man. He got really into the NC NAACP. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> racial integration, and literally about a quarter of his community, only twelve thousand people, were like out and out clan members. So there's a lot of uh, issues there. So the thing he ended up doing was contacting the NRA and asking them to set up a chapter in his community. And they actually got back in touch with them and set one up. And uh, <laughs> I believe he basically a bunch of uh, forty or fifty black men joined in. I think they were called the Black Revolutionary Guard, something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, they basically did the same thing. They would protect uh, protesters. They would protect these guys um, at their homes. And there was one incident where uh, the Klan members were getting together. And word got out they were going to attack the vice president of that chapter's NAACP's house. So they literally went full, like, you know, World War II. They started putting (laughs) sandbags around his house, uh, those NRA members showed up with rifles. And sure enough, the Klan members rolled up. And there was a shootout in the streets of this, you know, 12,000 population uh, North Carolina town um, over this. But it was technically legal. Not the shootout, but all those measures. Uh, yeah, the right to self-defense. The NRA. And we jumped on those really quick. But uh, what I see as the issue is jumping back to the Black Panthers, once I got really philosophical and revolutionary, they put out, I think it was called the 10-point plan. And point one talks about black self-determination and uh, we need to take uh, charge of ourselves. And they're really about that. They set up all those community programs in the neighborhood, try to push education onto the youth and basically tell them that, uh, you know, going around here being a thug isn't helping your race or you. And then if you look at the point, the 10-point plan, though, number two to me, it goes off the deep end and is the trouble with black thinking because it talks about number two says that the federal government needs to guarantee every black man a job um, and a certain standard. And like two through nine are more things that the federal government needs to do. They need to provide housing. They need to make sure there's universal education, all these things. And I hear that and I'm thinking, well, you're basically just wanting to replace the plantation with the federal government. That's Everything is undermining yeah. point one, and yeah. that's not really this black is not self-determination. Bla- yeah, it's not self-determination, I was about to say, to where, uh, to where not just black men, but uh, any adult uh, needs to get with the American spirit of individualism to realize the strength within oneself, not depend on the teat of the governments. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's, so what comes to philosophically with uh, white conservatives, to where I'm glad that they kept to uh, mostly to that mentality of, even though it's annoying to pull them up with your bootstraps, uh, <laughs> sort, of, sort, of, sort of thing. I find in my experience when I talk to black voters, if I'm working for um, conservatarian candidates, such as ones who say, oh yeah, we are going against uh, unnecessary <clears throat> uh, occupational licensing, that is my end with a lot of for black women voters to say, why should the government uh, get in the way between you starting your own business yeah. when it comes to, uh, to uh, when it comes to black owned businesses? Uh, because y'all are underrepresented among the general population. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually a really solid points. And um, <clears throat> and my law school last uh, year, I actually had um, there's a. I don't know what to call them, firm, company, organization called the Institute for Justice. Mm-hmm. And uh, their Texas office is out of Austin, but uh, they actually sued, started with the city, but the state ultimately over um, basically um, in Dallas particularly, there's a lot of African um, women who come over and the state was telling them they need to get a cosmetology license to braid hair. And then um, kind of segued into that eventually was, uh, I believe, Indian women we're being told the same thing to do eyebrow threading. But, uh, you know, they these ladies go through all these issues. And they actually ended up, on the Braiders case, she actually ended up following along with what they said and got a license. Mm-hmm. And then um, they came back to her and threatened to shut her business down. 
because she was then teaching other women how to braid hair. And they were saying, well, actually, um, to do this, if you're going to operate as a school, you need this many seats, uh, this many outlets, you need this safety plan to submit to us, all this other stuff. So they eventually go to this lawyer. <laughs> and the first thing he does is um, sends the state a letter where he basically details how the stuff you need to do to get a cosmetology license actually doesn't teach you to braid hair anyways. And those two fields never intersect. And um, he actually ended up having to go through two levels of uh, state courts just to get uh, this particular state agency to pull back. And it wasn't even a law saying that uh, um, if you're going to braid hair, you need a cosmetology license. It was a state bureaucracy interpreting their authority to include these black women trying to uh, do that. So... On that end, there's a lot we don't notice that holds us back because no one knows anything about the cosmetology board. No one knows about most, I'd say, Texans can't say what government entity hands out you know, the most licenses, mm -hmm. which is the TDLR, um, Department <coughs> of Licensing Regulations. Um, but they don't know what businesses are covered in there. And then even in those businesses, like I'd even say people... Like a cosmetologist probably knows what they had to do to get their license, but they don't sit there and browse those things to make sure they're actually keeping up with it. So on that end, I think a lot of it goes over our head and it goes over the average American's head. But oh, yeah, that's probably I'd say the most important thing, because that's boring background stuff that decides if you get to make money for yourself. Yes. Like that boring background stuff. It's not as exciting as 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 not, as dramatic, not to. Yeah, it's not. It's not to demean, for example, uh, instances instances of police brutality, or the more uh, bloody and newsworthy racial policies. Mm -hmm. But they, there's everyday injustices that, that disproportionately affects minorities. For example, uh, not not to not to segue too far into this, uh, for for gun control measures, it disproportionately affects minorities because minorities tend to be from lower income backgrounds. So it's a it's a greater uh, it's a greater financial barrier for us to pay for the classes and to maintain uh, all, all these regulations. Oh, um, I'd say definitely there. I think <clears throat> particularly black, really black men are the most like harmed by gun control. Uh, for example, you know, going back to that Black Panther example, um, the California their legislature is called the Assembly. They were actually like a bar partisan split back then. Uh, Ronald Reagan was their governor. They were perfectly split in their Senate, and their House uh, was democratically controlled. Before two years passed of the Black Panthers riding around following the cops in their neighborhood, that law got changed in something called, I believe it was the Mulford Act, like that quick. And it, uh, like their legislative record on the discussions they had on it, it was literally targeted to stop what the Black Panthers were doing. Yes. And uh, if you look at... Uh, I guess the best example I'd use is Illinois. If I want to visit my relatives in Chicago, I can't be armed. I can't even wear body armor up there. And they don't live in the best neighborhood. They've got, uh, you know, bulletproof uh, windows on the schools. And they've got the little police cameras uh, each corner. And some little device that uh, hones in if it hears a gunshot. They've got all these measures out there. It, it's pretty crap. So uh, that law really isn't, it's obviously not being effective if uh, I have so much higher likelihood of getting shot up there mm -hmm. and I get to be helpless at the same time. So um, those policies aren't, for one, I'd say they originated not too long ago since, you know, 1960 is mm -hmm. our parents' age, um, targeting mainly us. And then nowadays, even if they're not targeting us, even if they say it's, flatly, you know, universal, we get the raw end of it. Um, you know, if I'm going to get shot and murdered, um, or if someone's going to get shot and murdered, it's probably going to be a black guy. <clears throat> and it's not some uh, uh, KKK member on the other end of it. Yes. And that's the thing. Uh, I just tie this uh, back with how white conservatives could better affect, can be, be more effective with the messaging. Uh, just to summarize the points, uh, one is to... <clears throat> Well, first off, it'd be more knowledgeable about the boring background stuff. And, and to not be so afraid of identity politics to where, yes, uh, know what, is, what they care about, but don't think that's their default position. Just be armed with that, such as 
the as we talk about the background stuff of cosmetology licenses that prevent black women from having a schools for for schools and beauty shops for women with textured hair mm. so that their communities can be better served as well as all these barriers to entry that are prohibiting a generations of minority entrepreneurs and not to mention the <clears throat> conservatives we we need to keep with the ideological mindset of uh, a self-determination of independence and what better way to do that by saying let's get government out of the way of your american dream yeah like that's yeah that's much better than the entire oh back hundreds of years ago <laughs> <laughs> the democrats the clan I mean, that's probably the best pitch you could make um Shoot, take black out of it. Humanity's inherently pretty selfish. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, yeah, what's in it for you? Being tribalist to your own race is just one <laughs> step removed from being tribalist to yourself. So you can make a pretty broad appeal there. And probably the most enticing thing uh, you could tell me if I were just a totally politically whatever <clears throat> black guy is uh, what, you know, name one thing the uh, government has actually done right for you that. Uh, lifted your family up and saved y'all, and after I don't answer you, say, what if we just got them out of the way and uh, got rid of a bunch of laws? You do whatever you want to do. We'll just make it as accessible for you as you can. Have fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what most people, you know, despite race, want to do. And uh, at the moment on the other side, that's what, uh, I don't even want to say the Democrats entirely, because it's even wider than them. Just, mm-hmm. I'd say the left. Um, have people convinced that they, you know, can't do, um, like, uh, for example, the disparity of, let's say, black men in law schools. Um, if I just listen to, you know, that side of the perspective, it's because there's some either racist boogeyman or some insidious, unspoken of system out there of uh, biases that's Mm -hmm. preventing me from uh, climbing that high. And if I just vote enough for the men, that system's going to be dismantled, and all of a sudden I'm going to walk into my law school class and uh, it's going to be 50% black men. (laughs) We're only 7% of the U.S. population, but somehow they will get me in a class with 50% black men, and I I wouldn't want that. I mean, I could have gone to law school in uh, so many African countries if I wanted solely that. Um... But somehow, you know, I'm not automatically supposed to believe that's good, even though technically they're pitching me deeper segregation. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm supposed to believe that the um, either conservatives or Republican Party or both um, don't want that because of some hatred for me. And those, like, strict divisions, that's probably the big issue um, on the conservative side with outreach because you, those are pretty entrenched positions. You really got to do some work to um, even make like make a gap there long enough for someone to even hear your side out. Yeah. And the first thing as, as we go with my political experience is to actually take the first step to go in these neighborhoods. There's so many minority neighborhoods that voted Democrat for generations who said that I was the first Republican to ask for their votes. Yeah, that sounds about right. And that's the thing, too, where don't write out people's opinions, don't dismiss their opinions, and fight for their votes. Unless, unless, uh, because that's the thing, uh, while a lot of it is insular, of I just gotta follow the crowd mentality, well, that's not just black community, that's pretty much any, any, uh, the average voter. But they can't reach, they can't reach out if you don't give a lifeline. Yeah. Um, And honestly, that, in one way, it kind of perplexes me. Um, But at the same time, I, I hate saying the word branding, but that's that's really it. I, I hate marketing principles and ideals, but that's really what you got to do. That's what yeah. people want now. And they, the Republican Party sucks at it. Some conservatives are, uh, like, for example, Ben Shapiro yeah. markets conservative principles very well. He makes it very palatable. palatable. He's very clear about his stances, uh, the origin of that, everything. Um, if that guy were the head of the Texas Republican Party and we could just put a camera on him and have him uh, go into neighborhoods and talk to the people about their issues and what laws and policies are creating those. That'd be great, but uh, that doesn't exist. Um, so on that side, Republicans are very stale. It's sort of getting better, but uh, again, it's just a slow grind. And on the other side, though, uh, 
Democrats are not, they've been awake to this for a while. Um, mm-hmm. Like, it was a big news that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez made it into a representative seat. It's uh, huge how um, Ilhan Omar went from a Syrian refugee camp, I think Syria, or no, I think Yemen. Yeah, I mean, either way, she's got to go back. From the North African refugee camp, yeah. and now she's a state rep, or a federal representative in, um, I believe that's Minnesota, I want to say. But, uh, you know, at the same time, Senator Ted Cruz, like, he grew up extremely working class like a dad who washed dishes after floating here from uh, Cuba, after failing to try to overthrow a communist government. And he worked his way up. He got into a really good law school. He immediately came back and worked for the state that he grew up in. Um, people don't know he was our solicitor general for a long time, and he actually argued representing Texas to the Supreme Court a bunch about um, basically in favor of we Texans see as our values mm-hmm. and why the federal government needs to stay out to the federal government. And then we made him a senator. That's a hell of a story. And uh, if you look at like a Democrat Republican split, the Democrats. Um, I believe they've never had a Hispanic win a primary Hmm. in any state. Whereas last year, last election, Ted Cruz won a bunch. And it was actually a big upset when he didn't beat Trump. Um, And again, a guy that whose dad floated here on a raft with uh, basically most of his uh, belongings hidden in his underwear. So while he was smuggling himself out of Cuba, that's a hell of a story. Or um, Ben Carson. Um, an actual black guy, our current uh, head of, shoot, Housing and Urban Development Secretary. But um, he went from being a guy in the ghetto with a single mom to a literally world-famous neurosurgeon who, for some reason, decided to get into Republican politics. But, uh, you know, on the Republican side, you don't market, you don't see marketing for Ben Carson. You don't see Ben Carson telling a story and talking about how... uh, Proud he yeah, is. we're not good at telling narratives. Yeah, that, uh, that one's rough. Like, the best Republican spokesman we have is Kanye West, and he's really not even, like, heavy Republican. He's just heavy think-for-yourself. Yeah, most definitely. And on the subject of Kanye West, and while we're talking about things that Wax are doing wrong, uh, that's... Yeah, something that annoys me about, uh, I would call the basic uh, white conservative online, is how they're so desperate for minority support to just, okay, so, oh, look, there's minorities who are supporting our ideas, to they just, uh, they just pull up Pete Buttigieg and just have them, as, uh, have them so visible. I don't know if you've seen uh, Pete Buttigieg's uh, uh, ca- campaigns, but mm. there was a, okay, so uh, make this a, sh- a short story. There were, he, he was uh, uh, campaigning in Iowa, and there was, his, uh, there was a rally to where, they, of course, they would see people in the bleachers behind the politician while they're speaking to the camera because yeah. it's such an honor to watch someone's back <laughs> of the head at a rally. And the thing is, the crowd was mostly white, but uh, there's, a, there's a clear overrepresentation of black people on the bleachers to where, they, to where some of them uh, spoke to the reporters saying it was weird how they were selected to, <laughs> to go behind. <laughs> but the same thing happens to conservatives who crowd around people, for example, like Candace Owen, and say, oh, look, we got a black. <laughs> yeah, I feel that one. And uh, I'm slightly biased since I recently got asked to take like an official position with the Texas Plexit Party. And <clears throat> that whole organization, is she's at the head. Yeah. And uh, there's some, there's actually some like hardcore positions that she and I disagree on. But uh, her real core message isn't even so much uh, go be a Republican. It's... Uh, the fact that uh, democratic policies and hardcore democratic loyalty got like us as a race into this crappy place. Mm-hmm. And then uh, at the same time, the, honestly, the biggest opponents I can have in America since I've been born is other black people. Like, um, if you want to talk about the murder rates, who's going to shoot me? Probably another black person. I... It is huge news if a white supremacist ever accosts me in any way. That's, and it's not huge because of uh, it being a good story, which it would be, but because mm-hmm. of how improbable it is that it just doesn't freaking happen. But uh, you know, if I if I go back to Colleen and uh, get shot, I'll your avenue. By, that's uh, 
That's not going to be world-breaking news. It's like, oh, yeah, a black guy killed another black guy. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, yeah. Say they were wearing MAGA hats, though, and it was Oh, no, Jesse guys. Smollett. <laughs> yeah, that'll get me international news. That'll get me all the... I'll get a book deal. Everyone's going to want me over. They'll invite me to the uh, Democratic primaries. I'll... Yeah, that's I'll the thing that ki- yeah, that's the thing that kills me with all this. So this is a good segue into on how the other side can uh, better treat the black community to where, uh, can, where is this energy against uh, alleged racist MAGA or the new Klan or these neo Nazis beating up black folks? Where's this energy when it is, uh, as you said, black on black crime? Yeah, um, to where they only care they can score political points against their white opponents. Yeah, that that one throws me and. On one end, I like I don't really I don't even sure if I see my way to a clear solution on that one, and it's actually even a long-standing problem. You know, <clears throat> as racist as society was in the 1960s, it was not a racist white guy that caused Malcolm X to die, for example. Um, the biggest threat domestically here is insular violence, and in my mind, the first thing any politician can do is just basically go back to the basics. Um, you know, the Black Panthers, the uh, gentleman up in North Carolina, <clears throat> they didn't want to not die to Klan members. They wanted to not die and not be defenseless. Mm-hmm. If, uh, you know, someone kicks in my door, I I really don't care about the racial history of that individual. I want to be able to defend myself. Most definitely. I want policies that uh, discourage somebody from uh, wanting to go kick in doors. Yeah, whether it's no-knock raids or stop and frisk, anything that targets people that violates our constitutional rights. Yeah. And uh, inherently, I'm against stop and frisk, but uh, coincidentally, we're actually on that like uh, section of uh, constitutional law in, my, in law school, and we had a big discussion over it, and I actually looked deeply into it, and it, uh, it's such a freaking divide. Because on one hand, like the big argument is it disproportionately affects minorities than uh, white people. Um, and if you break down just basic math, well, the math is kind of racist. Uh, crime-ridden neighborhoods are disproportionately minority. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you're gonna, if you have a limited amount of police resources and you have a, a bunch of black or Latino neighborhoods that are have a bunch of uh, violent crimes going on, you basically can either divert more resources to where more crime is, even if that targets more minorities inherently, mm-hmm. or you can say. Well, to be safe, let's go ahead and uh, take half of them and disperse them into the white neighborhoods that uh, report, you know, 90% less crime. Obviously, that's half a police force that's not going to be uh, catching crime. And then all racial um, optics aside, the math on that is that less people are going to get caught in the bad neighborhoods, which means the minorities living in that bad neighborhood are less safe. Mm-hmm. Um, however, obviously, there's a limiting principle there because, uh, again, we're talking about the government cracking down on people, and there's a lot that in stop and frisk is blatantly like illegal. You still need a tangible, articulable reason to stop somebody as a officer of the state and search their outer person. Um, you still need to meet that basic threshold, and a bunch of cops going around trying to invent ways to do that, that obviously irks against me. I don't care how safe they're making other black people or anybody um, because that's not actually, that shouldn't be our big concern. Yeah, and also because I fear for my life, you better have actual reason to fear for your life. I'm tired of that excuse. Oh, yeah. Um, That's one thing I think Texas gets right on the law. There's no special right to defend yourself if you're a police officer. Um, If a cop shoots me saying uh, it was in defense of himself, when you know he gets charged, his lawyers are going to assert the exact same uh, section of the law that I would get to assert if I killed him. Mm-hmm. So, uh, legally speaking, they're definitely held to the same standard here in the state, anyways. Mm-hmm. Realistically speaking, and you better be good at picking a jury, um, because they, there's just an occupational bias there. We're, we kind of glorify them, which is troubling as hell, but uh, that's the way it is. Yeah. And uh, to bring this over to how white liberals, uh, so um, uh, I'm, I'm a former Democrat. Yeah, you wouldn't have liked me in high school to where 
uh, this flaming gay guy who was uh, <laughs> one of my viewers. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm gay, but I was super gay in high school, and I was a flaming liberal too. So if you were homo, that, if you were homo, if you had a time machine, I went back in time, tried to be friends with me when I was a freshman in high school, uh, spouting my liberal views. I would not blame you if you were homophobic. In fact, I would expect it, and you would earn it by that point. <laughs> but yeah, you gotta thank God there wasn't so much social media back then. <laughs> so you were, I, I swear, oh, you yeah. would have been one of those guys always Snapchatting. You'd have like a four-year-long Twitter feed by the time you hit <laughs> high school. Level, all this shit. You'd be fervently trying to erase everything. And uh, my thing of, yeah, I'm so glad that any pictures of myself in Obama sweatshirt does not survive to this current day. <laughs> to where, oh yeah, he did great as the first black president. <laughs> You're going to confuse the hell of everybody next year at the reunion, though. Oh, most definitely. Oh, whoever hasn't kept up with you. Yeah, but uh, as for, so being a former uh, liberal uh, myself, I can talk about just how white liberals are clearly missing the mark when it comes to minority outreach. First off, is it's a, it's a mirror image of what conservatives are doing, to where they just write off opinions and say, oh, the basic default position for us minorities is the democratic votes, that they can just depend on the views no matter what, because they just, this strategy of just tell them that Republicans are racist enough, then they'll only vote for us. Mm. Um. I'm only coincidentally very up to speed on this because I just gave a talk for it in uh, my group at the law school uh, for our Black History Month meeting. And there's two like uh, arenas that I looked at in, you know, basically just law and society. And I started off by playing a YouTube video of uh, Amy Horowitz. He went to, I believe it was UC Berkeley, and asked uh, just random white people walking around campus mm -hmm. what they thought about voter ID laws, and off the bat, um, I think it was about eight people he talked to in, or that were filmed and made it to the cut in total, said it was racist. And then those people, he went in like, okay, why is it racist? And it impacts minorities. And it's like, okay, how is that? And uh, one guy's like, well, the uh, certain IDs that they want is, um, you know, going to be very difficult for people in those communities to get. They statistically just uh, have less access to them. And he was like, okay, what about uh, doing it online? And uh, one guy was like, well, that requires being able to pay an internet service provider and uh, being able to get that. And that same question they cut to, you know, a younger white student there. And she's like, well, you know, I just feel like they don't really have access to or the knowledge to be able to find out what's out there. And I'm actually quoting her. That's not even paraphrasing. Uh. And uh, one guy, and oh, my God, it, it was funny because he's like the stereotypical, like, college white liberal, um, big guy, white guy. And he's like, well, you know. You gotta remember when you're talking about these people, these aren't really people that are in the best environments and have had that sterling, you know, civics education. They, they kind of just left with what you got. And in their just, minds, they're advocating for like an oppressed people, and they think that they're pushing a policy forward that is going to make uh, black people en masse have uh, better access to voting by not making them have IDs. When, and as soon as you actually justify that, you're basically saying, well, they're a degenerate people that uh, can't figure out the basic way society functions, you got to give them a leg up. Yeah, this is the soft bigotry of low expectations. Yeah, um, absolutely. And uh, that's, that's the attitude that is seen among a lot of white liberals in my experience to where, uh, for example, I, I forgot which, uh, I think it's the University of Pennsylvania who did this study, to where they compared uh, liberals, uh, white liberals and white conservatives in conversing with white and minority audiences. And they found that white conservatives most of they, there was barely a difference in how they uh, present themselves to whites or minorities. They will speak the same no matter what. They'll use the same addiction. They'll, uh, they'll have the same level of respect mm -hmm. versus a white liberal who will go into the Cortez code switching. They will not go as stream as clapping every syllable, but <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be more slang. There's going to be more appropriation uh, to look hip to a, a young black voter. Yeah, uh, I hate that. But um, and while I was getting ready for that talk I told you about, I kind of think you can boil down, not even just black, but anybody's philosophy on like what to do with black people and what policies help them to like two, I guess, camps. Because I was, I was looking at the legal perspective when I was mm -hmm. getting ready for my talk and. Everyone knows Brown versus Board of Education. Mm -hmm. If you actually go and read that uh, ruling, which is surprisingly short, by the way, for what it did, they basically f said, 
unanimously that separate but equal is unequal because black people not being able to grow up alongside and intermix with whites inherently makes them uh, worse off. And at the time, it was a big victory. And Thurgood Marshall, who went on to be our first black Supreme Court justice, he followed that philosophy to its core. But our current black Supreme Court justice, Clarence Thomas, has like the exact opposite view. Hmm. Because, um, and he described it in an opinion, basically calling it a uh, faddish theory of racial integration. Because inherently what you're saying is that black people, if they grow up among themselves, are inherently somehow worse off. And you got to sprinkle them in to be around whites to look up to. And not doing that violates their rights to an equal education is really what Brown is saying. And um, I looked at some statistics for higher education today um, across all universities in the U.S. I believe it's... 46% will offer uh, um, segregated orientations. 76%, I believe, offer uh, segregated um, housing. And I don't remember the exact one, but somewhere between those two numbers was uh, segregated graduation ceremonies. And you know, even as recently as last week, there was, um, I believe it was in Ohio, where there's a... Uh, um, a woman had come into some multicultural center or something, and she was a university employee and was basically gave a rant on how um, there's too many white people there and that's really meant to be an inclusive space for minorities to come and feel safe, and she's a minority and doesn't feel safe. And, you know, going back to that state theory, that's a, you know, a university employee is a state agent. Mm -hmm. She's telling people to, uh, or that they should get out of uh, the center for being white. And uh, there's even... Somewhere else in Ohio, some other university, they actually had a push to build a gym or a recreational center um, that would only be limited to minorities um, and white people wouldn't be able to do it. And on the legal side of what we were debating, uh, my position was, OK, do the white people not have to pay the university fees that go towards building it since they're not going to get the advantage of it? Uh, if, if yes, then uh, that means you're going to take non-white people and charge them more tuition to build something they may or may not even want so they don't have to be around whites in which case you know please explain to me why brown versus board was a good decision at all if you're basically undoing that mm -hmm. so you know now uh i guess 70 or so years later we're pushing a, well white liberals and i see being the huge catalyst of it but uh there's definitely not a black outcry against it are pushing to basically resegregate, saying it's good for the minorities, when, you know, their parents and grandparents were like, oh, thank God we can just treat them like people now, and uh, there's no more segregation. Um, so we're, we're regressing, but now the regress is coming from the left, and yeah. most of those people generally think they're, you know, they generally think they're helping. Uh, they think if they walk into, let's say, a computer science classroom at uh, Harvard, and see nothing but uh, black people and Indian women. Uh, oh, oh, God, <laughs> we've done it. We've achieved diversity. Racism is over. Yeah. And it's like, well, no, everyone else didn't disappear. There, there are qualified people of other races somewhere. Where'd you push them to? So uh, now we've just moved to a new faddish theory about racial balancing since the days of uh, us celebrating that we don't have to worry about racial balancing. Yeah, that's the thing that white liberals miss the, the mark on when it comes to... Uh, so, something about, so just uh, tying this back a little bit with uh, some white conservatives. So some white conservatives, and Mayor Bloomberg, uh, I'll include him in this because he's part <laughs> of this mentality, to where they were, they're, they're, they're right, but they're worst kind of right, to where they look at crime statistics and say, oh, minorities are overrepresented. Therefore, they cause the crime instead of addressing the root causes, such as how males, we tend to be more predispositioned to be more agitated when we're from boredom and we're more predispositioned to violence. Mm -hmm. So we need an outlet for this aggression, productive outlets. Not, okay, let's have police occupation in his neighborhood in the name of you know quality or whatever he made his argument for. Yeah. But tying to all white liberals, they look at disparity uh, between um, uh, black and white education attainments and they say, oh, we need affirmative action, whether it's outright or just stealth affirmative action yeah. in order to uh, balance it. Oh, and we also need to have resegregation. Otherwise, uh, colored people will suffer from otherism. 
Yeah, I can't uh, get behind that one. And, uh, you know, going back to the Clarence Thomas example, uh, that guy, you know, one of the most popular legal officials, in, or not powerful legal officials mm -hmm. in the country right now because he's a Supreme Court justice, he benefited from uh, an affirmative action admissions policy getting into uh, the Ivy League school he got into. And that fact, like, followed him his whole life. He was actually against affirmative action because of how, like, uh, denigrated he was for it. And when, I can't remember if it was Bush or Reagan, picked him to be on the Supreme Court. I want to say Bush. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of people arguing that Bush picked him because he's black. This is yeah. new affirmative action. And then when he started voting against affirmative action in some of his Supreme Court rulings, people went around and called him a hypocrite. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, you give, he's a black guy that uh, worked hard, got himself into a place. He can't help what policies were around him, and he didn't ask to be lifted up. And people involuntarily lifting him up for him has literally followed him into his uh, 60s to where uh, he can't even get real credit because uh, he's got a fight to just uh, argue that he has earned a seat at a table. And if Clarence Thomas can ev evade that, what am I going to do? Yeah. That's the thing, too, where uh, particularly white liberals, they, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, the further action hurts minorities to where we have to fight. Yeah, for example, if someone hired me and just paraded me around as, oh, hey, look at our gay employee. We've uh, pride ourselves in diversity mm -hmm. to where I'm nothing more than a dog and pony show. Was I, hi was I promoted for my merits or was I promoted for something that I could not help? Yeah. I mean, I could help with aiding a Chick-fil-A, but you get the points to where it is. The thing that people miss the mark on is that uh, m most of us, we don't want to be inspirations. We just want to be respected. Yeah. And that's, uh, I don't know, I see that basically just as much harmful. And kind of on their side, hypocritical too. Yeah. Because, um, for example, every boon I'll get, every supposed policy that's going to help me, uh, to juxtapose it, let's look at the Harvard lawsuit for blatantly discriminating against Asians. Mm -hmm. uh, they're technically even more of a minority than me because there's less of them. Uh, but they're, they're not getting any hands out. No one is out there talking about why Asians need a leg up, why there needs mm -hmm. to be more of them anywhere. And, you know, the reason not is because they disproportionately have the upper end of everything. They make more than whites, men and women. Mm -hmm. They make up a super disproportionate amount of uh, um, C not CEOs, but... Uh, um, Business owners, entrepreneurs. Yeah, well, successful ones, educated, yeah. ones that don't yeah. uh, fail. Uh, fail in the first five years. And then uh, the people who will go on to get graduate educations. Mm -hmm. And you know, no, no one's talking about why that's. Uh, no one's going to argue that there's a secret cabal out there to boost up Asians, and that's why they're doing so well. So by that same token, there can't be some secret cabal to push down um, African Americans. And even looking at the statistics, which surprised me. Um, Statistically speaking, for one, across the board, black women just trounce black men. They don't fail out of university nearly as much as we do. They get more of the um, after bachelor degrees, graduate level degrees. They earn more. They are about, I think they want to say they're about 3 to 4% of the prison population. And uh, we're not 3 to 4%, now it's black men. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're equally black. Those systems got to be screwing them over too. And if you take just American blacks versus uh, migrant blacks, it really gets started. Yeah. They start businesses. They get degrees. They really instill education in their kids. They just have different values. And you can see the output of that and the outcomes that they get. Um, so a lot of this stuff really kind of evades policy and goes into just yeah, culture. what you do. Yeah. Um, and that's something we can do for ourselves. And honestly, the only thing people outside the culture could really do is set up an environment that uh, um, invigorates the culture to do something. Yeah. Like, um, and actually level the playing field. Do not give a leg up. It wants to be targets for other people. Yeah. Because um, if you, for example, were given a law firm because of some, uh, some law that says, okay, we're going to have this uh, federal money for a uh, black law firms. People are going to point to you and say, oh, you didn't earn your success. Yeah, basically. And that, that part would irritate me. But um, on one hand, those people saying, and you can, I can't even call them like evil or anything because they generally don't know. And uh, 
even taking an example, because I went to my own law firm. Mm -hmm. Let's say there were affirmative action across the board and, you know, just uh, university, law school, all of that. And as an example, let's say I know for a fact that uh, Indian women are the only ones benefiting. And let's say I run my firm and there's an Indian woman who's applying. I do seriously have to wonder if she is, uh, like, if she went to Yale and all that. Yeah. The fact that she didn't fail out of it tells me something, but uh, I don't actually know if she beat out other people to get there or was boosted there. I don't actually know what her objective skills are. And considering I'm running a law firm, you know, if I tell someone who's actually less qualified to go defend one of my criminal clients, uh, affirmative action, like the ideal behind it and all that's great, but uh, if my guy gets sent to prison because I yeah. have someone inadequate when, uh, you know, Jamal or the white guy who applied would have been just as great. I, I'm boned. That guy is super boned. And yeah. uh, that uh, woman actually, I'd say she probably gets the worst end of the stick. She has to rationally wonder if she's being honest. Is, does she even really deserve to be there? Is she yeah. a token? That doubt will follow her entire career. Yeah. So no one really wins. You just took a policy I mean, and the made three victims. Win. Yeah, they get to pass this laws back and say, oh, look at what we did for the blacks. Uh, now stay in your neighborhoods. Don't uh, eat yeah, at the table. Yeah, the white guy who gets a plaque and, uh, yeah. you know, the Democratic nomination, he'll, <laughs> he'll come out and he doesn't have to meet or explain himself to those three people. But, uh, you know, the guy in jail, the employer and the employee, they they all got to sit there with it. Um, and unfortunately, what I suspect is happening or will end up happening is like, if I really wanted to avoid that, the best thing I can do is just not hire Indian women. Yeah. I, the best thing I can do for the people who are going to employ me, the best way I can serve my community is to not even put them in that risk. I'll just take the guy I know is not getting any boost because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, a, if an Asian male comes to me and got into Harvard, I'm like, wow, they set even higher bars for you than everybody else. You really must have worked there. And you went to Harvard Law. Well, you're employed. And that's the practical, smart thing for me to do, even though that is basically just more discrimination that they've made the smart and wise thing to do with their affirmative action. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, to boil it down on the white liberal end side is that the biggest, uh, being a recovering liberal myself, the biggest AIDS that I see, <laughs> I can't get to say this <laughs> again, <laughs> the AIDS that affects uh, white liberalism is the fact that Good intentions outweigh disastrous consequences. So as long as your intentions were good, it doesn't matter what the outcome was. To where I think that's just complete, as I said, living AIDS. But the, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, and there's also this, and just go back on the entire uh, concept mm -hmm. of how white uh, liberals take black voters for granted. So when I worked in Michigan, a very white state, uh, there, there was at this time, the fat of the month was the March for Our Lives uh, BS. Mm. And the Mar so March for Our Lives a rally, of course, in Michigan was going to be very white. And uh, I, I, was, I was there to look operative. I was just observing it, just so I can give the other side a fair shake. And just overhearing everyone's conversations, I remember there's this, well, there's this one white woman, of course, is a white woman. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she, had, she brought her little kid to, the, to this uh, political rally, you know, this four-year-old, because of course he's going to know what politics are talking about. <laughs> and, and, tell him, and while, you know, she's telling him to hold his sign, they, they got this little, um, she got a, a, a lot of buttons, because mm -hmm. of course, all liberal vehicles have to have all sorts of bumper stickers, just as much as their purses have to have all little buttons of what causes they support that particular month. And oh, there was a Black Lives Matter sticker there, um, or button, whatever. And this one was no crap talking to this little kid about, oh, because uh, they're at March for Our Lives, which is an anti-gun rally. Mm -hmm. And she and the kid and the kid was asking, oh, why they were there? Uh, What's this all about? And she said, oh, uh, oh, oh, yeah, we're 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 trying to save people's lives. Uh, and she and she had this line: o only the police should have guns. To her, how tone deaf are you? <laughs> if you have a Black Lives Matter badge and say only the police should have guns, yeah. And, I don't know how those yeah. coexist, but God, those people. Oh, that's man. basically the, literally speaking, that's currently basically the Democratic pol uh, yeah. kind of policy um, platform. It yeah. will be the policy if enough of them win, but. Uh, yeah. And they were, oh yeah, we support diversity, but not if you're armed. 
Yeah. That, we don't want part. you to be equal to us. I really don't understand that. That Honestly, there should be more of a push for that. Like, realistically speaking, if you want to go by the numbers, uh, God, America is the safest today than it ever has been in the history of the country. Um, but let's say I bought the apocalyptic scenario that, uh, you know, the left was trying to sell me where I'm not going to be able to succeed because of institutional uh, or... Uh, yeah, institutional, institutional systemic racism and all that. Oh, and by the way, the police want to kill me. Oh, and these Republican policies want to take what little I have left and give it to billionaires to uh, Red Maga has said the new clan hood. Exactly. Well, uh, you know what? What's left for me if I can't at least defend my life? You, you tell me to give that up too, and you're my exactly. savior. Um, you know, if I don't know where I saw it, but there's some thing I read online where. Uh, there was a gay conservative, and he was saying, you know, at heart, armed gays don't get bashed, so really no gay person or transgender individual, if they're really so targeted, like they keep saying, should be against uh, a more expansive Second Amendment rights, because uh, you're basically arguing why you should be more vulnerable, and you should cross your fingers that uh, the government gets better at protecting you. Yeah, because that's a sleight of hand, as you said, that... Uh, a Democratic Party particularly pushes is that the message of, oh, minorities, you're marginalized, the government doesn't represent you, but also you don't get to defend yourselves from said governments. Mm -hmm. To where you just want us to, again, as you said, replace this plantation <laughs> with the Democratic Party. Yeah. So replacing this with the governments, uh, making them their master. And uh, uh, from your perspective, what do you see white liberals are missing the market? Because I've been bashing them pretty much, this is pretty much what this show is about, just bashing white liberals. <laughs> but, uh, I'd have to take a different position than yours right. on their biggest sin. I think, honestly, just ignorance is uh, the biggest problem uh, that white liberals are having. Because uh, Dinesh D'Souza, for example, gave a talk where he was talking about um, how these leftist misconceptions tend to take root. So you'll have uh, something said. Like, for example, um, what was it, 76% uh, women thing? And... That statistic blew up, and there are literally millions of people on the left who just take that thing as true. Yeah. They didn't research it. They just saw enough people share it, either enough people in their friend group to where, in their mind, that cement it is true enough, or enough people uh, that they look up to share it and keep quoting it. And the channels that they watch, like, you know, uh, John Oliver never said it wasn't true. Otherwise, he would have made oh, fun yeah. of it. Um, whoever that South African comedian, Trevor Noah, never tore it down. Um, Bill Maher quoted it, uh, or someone said it on Bill Maher, and he didn't shred them. So, yeah, this is just a known thing. It must be true. Whereas, you know, you look at literally what they mathematically did, uh, just take an average, uh, um, the average that men earn, the average that women earn, and come up with a factor or the figure there and say, yep, discrimination. Mm -hmm. As if there's, you know, no more nuance to it than that. That's lazy as hell. But they do that. Oh, yeah. Um, and they generally think they're right because of, you know, the way it spread and not seeing it challenged. So they just uh, push on with that narrative and they'll sit there and tell it to me. And then uh, when I buck back, they're like, well, you mean you don't know? I, all these people said it. And I'll be like, well, there's this other study where they actually added in these other factors. Oh, really? Who published those? Oh, hmm. That's a conservative institute. I don't oh, know. I remember that uh, of that seventy cents cents dollar figure that uh, that Obama's presidency was cha was challenged uh, with. Oh, then why do you pay your female staffers less? And his uh, and his um, and the White House responded by saying, "Oh, there's um, their people are paid differently based on their experience, education levels, <laughs> and uh, the hours they work." We're thinking this is exactly the same argument trying to think. <laughs> I mean, exactly. <laughs> like, um, yeah, so but, on the liberal yeah. side, not not knowing that makes them uh, come to have these harmful beliefs that I've been explaining. And then uh, the reason they don't know is because they don't really bother to look, especially in the age of Google. Nothing's not out there. Everything I said is on the first page of a Google search. But they don't feel the impetus to go make that search yeah. because um, they see it enough on Facebook. They see enough of their friends parrot it. They see it said on TV. Why bother? Someone else must have oh, done yeah. it. And the white liberals, uh, in order to not step out of line, get the liberal card revoked. <laughs> just, just like you know, you're yeah, not that too. There's a real incentive to fall in line, and it's. Uh, 
I think it also kind of weighs into just the way humanity's going, where we just something sounds technical enough or advanced enough, we just will fall in. Like, uh, I could write a headline, and as long as I lead it with the word "study shows." Mm-hmm. Anything I say after that? Study shows, science shows. I'm a political scientist. Okay, I hate political scientists yeah. first off. <laughs> but that, yeah, like, just, you know, no one's going to challenge it. Mm-hmm. And as long as it fits their narrative. Yeah. And there's some stuff out there, like everyone publishes their data. No one really hides the ball on that. But uh, no one really yeah, on the ground level is going to dig into that. Yeah, uh, to go into the details, to find new ones. And uh, the same criticism that you levy against white liberals is similar to the one levying against white conservatives to where a lot of white conservatives, as you uh, point out, aren't reading into occupational licensing. Oh, yeah. That's uh, just yeah. boring. Yeah. But, um, you know, on their end, I really think uh, white conservatives, if they really want to make black people more conservative, you just got to do better about, for one, branding, because I don't know why, but we are a... I don't know. Yeah, we Flashy. don't tell. Yeah, we don't tell stories just like the Democrats do. And well, we're very visual people. I don't know. No, it's, yeah, we just move with the culture for the most part. And anyone who doesn't is kind of an outlier. Um, that's why you saw that huge freaking spike uh, for Trump as soon as Kanye West comes out and says it's cool. And you know, as soon as Kim Kardashian's at the uh, White House talking about it, for, yeah, exonerating first, yeah. people mm-hmm. magically, freaking uh, within that same year, <clears throat> Congress, the hugely split bipartisan Congress, can pass a bill. Um, all those constituencies, even across uh, partisan lines, really care about uh, federal recidivism now and uh, oh, yes. loosening that. When really it's just, no, it just became culturally cool to do that, thanks to two celebrities. Mm-hmm. So um, If two celebrities can do it, imagine what, if white conservatives would follow that lead and be those kind of people themselves and outreach, say, hey, we can buy this. And also the entire thing of stop with the brand, what's up with defaulting to Blue Lives Matter every time there's a police-involved shooting. Yeah, that too. Yeah, wait um, for information to come out. I, on one hand, I, I actually really don't mind demonizing police who shoot people. Like, uh, in my view, if you're a state employee who just killed somebody, um, you, you got a bit of a... You need to dig yourself out of that one. Um, I really don't want, like, a fair shake from the outside... The only place I really want them to have, like, even ground or even a preference is in their criminal trial. I don't want the jury ready to hang them, but uh, no, I'm, I'm skeptical as is. It's just the source of my skepticism isn't going to jump to, he hates blacks. It must be that. Or uh, yeah. he must be a misogynist or yeah, whatever. That's the same thing, too, where you can't just say, oh, uh, anytime there's the beginnings of a case, as I said, the media just likes to publish this out and everyone just takes their side. It's like, oh, uh, he was just a thug or, oh, the police officer, she was just doing her job. Yeah. She was just in the wrong apartment. She feared for her life. I yeah. hated that case. And that one, um, I really split with uh, conservatives on that one just because, uh, God, there's some, I would say, are some conservative uh, like positions are really tangentially racist and, um, well, some positions that some conservatives have, not the positions themselves. But, like, uh, for example, I uh, was arguing about that case with Amber Geiger. And actually, for the most part, I was uh, somewhat, like, sympathetic to that officer's side because I basically believed her version of the story, which is, uh, you know, you walk to the wrong apartment, you hear movement, you think you're in your apartment, you shoot. That's exactly what I would do. And coincidentally, like, the month before that all happened... Mm-hmm. I actually did do exactly, almost did exactly that. I was um, in Austin uh, working at the district attorney's office. Uh, my elevator, I hit uh, three, the floor I was on. I didn't know someone had hit two. So when it stopped, I got out. And I'm like in an after work daze. So I'm just like, yep, go down this long hallway. There's a fire extinguisher on the wall. Let me go in. And uh, my electronic key card didn't work. So I'm like pounding on the door trying to get to one of the roommates to wake up and let me in. And um, I was so pissed. I, I pulled out my phone to call them, and it was only at that point that uh, I actually looked up at the freaking room number, and I was like, oh, crap. And, uh, like, if that door were unlocked, it might be me that was on TV shooting somebody that I thought was in my um, apartment um, when I was supposed to be alone. So um, on one end, I can sympathize with that, but uh, I still totally get, like, the outcome of that. And when I was arguing with it with the conservatives, basically, instead of, like, trying to tear apart my points, it was, oh, 
um, respectfully, man, I think you're a little too close to this issue. And, uh, you know, you're not really thinking logically here. Okay, you know that it's going to be a bad uh, statement, anything that follows. Res- with all due respect, <laughs> or respectfully speaking, no offense, or my favorite, I'm not racist, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, uh, that, that, that part threw me. And, oh, God, when it comes to police in general, I think that's where conservatives really drop the ball. Yes. Because uh, you... Stand up for any gun owner, regardless of color of skin. Oh, yeah. Uh, who is a victim of... Oh, the officer, the officer was in fear for their life because this, they will say, hey, I'm a gun owner. Uh, I'm going to show you my license. And then, boom, they get shot. And then we just hear from uh, just crick. You know, the, the best that we hear from online conservatives is crickets. Mm-hmm. And the worst that we hear is, oh, well, he was a thug or he was reaching too fast or whatever. That's the thing. If you're a police officer, yeah. you're that, it, you're that trigger happy. You shouldn't be on the job. That, uh, that's actually one of the only things I really agree with Trevor Noah about. I don't know why I came on my Facebook, but he was just tearing apart the NRA. She was like, this is basically you guys' freaking motto. This is a lawful gun owner trying to go about his business. Yeah. Stopped, um, uh, ultimately mistakenly, who informed a police officer, an agent of the state, that uh, he was armed and then was shot while committing no crime. Nothing from them. And then, uh, coincidentally, after that all happened, the next like official NRA thing I had heard was um, a radio ad in my car for their uh, Blue Stars or something program, which is basically giving them money so they can donate vehicles to officers and something like that. And I'm like, wow, you guys missed the message there. And that actually stopped me from joining them because uh, I I want to say a month or two before that, I had just been to my first gun show, and there was an NRA rep there, and I just didn't know what they were about, so I didn't join then. But I was looking into them. I like their positions. I like um, um, some of their like shows and all that. And then that happened, and they didn't come out of the woodwork advocating, like, supposedly my membership dollars would have went to. So I was like, yeah, no, no thank you. So conservative-wide, they got to be vocal about uh, that one. And yeah, the reason then, I think yeah. they're not is maybe they're associating, like, being a counter to the police to basically standing right next to Black Lives Matter and uh, screeching about killing them. Um, or that they're all racist when, I don't know, conservatives yeah, should know yeah. best, there's nuance. Yeah, there's nuance. And that's the thing that both uh, white liberals and white conservatives are missing is the nuance. Yeah. And so if you're a white liberal, white conservative out there, just please do research. Don't assume people's uh, beliefs. Fight for the vote. Try to convince them based on the merits of an argument. Don't say, oh, I think you're too close to this issue. Or uh, say, <laughs> okay, so which Democrat are you voting for, fellow uh, minority? <laughs> but, oh, God. Oh, yeah. My goodness. Uh, I hate that. I, I, I don't know if you've been spammed with a, a DNC uh, a candidates, a me- campaigns messaging you. I've been getting emails, but uh, surprisingly, I've not gotten any texts. Yeah. Um, maybe they just haven't gotten to me yet. Text isn't up. Well, actually, if you're getting in, you're... Just yeah. as much here. Yeah, freaking booty is getting to me. But uh, no, 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 maybe they know. Maybe it's because I was in yeah. the news so much last year. Oh, speaking of DNC candidates, uh, let's talk about P- uh, white liberals we want to deport. So I, uh, I want to nominate uh, Bloomberg uh, for not, not just because of Southern Frisk and his harm to uh, minority communities, but just for the fact that I just see too many damn Bloomberg ads everywhere I go. For, I'm a nanny for my uh, viewers and listeners out there. And I was, and I was watching um, uh, my, my kids over the weekend. And uh, when we were trying to play music videos, and one music video that one of my kids tried, wanted to play was uh, Witch Doctor, which goes, ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah. But before that could play, there was a Bloomberg ad saying, oh, <laughs> I can get it done. Uh, we, can we count on your votes? <laughs> Oh my goodness! I just okay. I want to deport my Bloomberg, but uh, Brandon, who do you want to deport? I've been thinking on this the whole time I've been talking, but uh, in that universe, I uh, I gotta go hardcore freaking booty jug. <laughs> oh my goodness! When he fake black endorsements, oh uh, god, that was even the worst. <laughs> he has like a, he has those adopted sons that he trots out when uh, convenience, and like I don't. First, I don't, I don't personally really like much about him. Uh, politically speaking, that guy is secretly a radical, and not even secret. It like slips out in a lot of stuff that he says. Mm-hmm. His policies, like if we took exactly what he said his policies were and enacted them, it would demonstrably do pretty good harm to my own people. So I kind of have a duty to be against him right there. 
he's got those uh, children that he trots out when it's convenient. Um, and then when he was actually mayor, he really didn't push forward any policies that, uh, I don't know, boosted what it was like to live in his city while being black. And I know there's that controversial shooting that he uh, just, oddly enough, didn't do much about. Mm-hmm. Even though, technically speaking, the mayor is like the most powerful police official in a city because he runs the police department. Um, but, yeah, that's uh, pretty much what it comes down for me. With Bloomberg, I between the two of them, I, I would totally tell my kids to look up to Bloomberg. <laughs> I need mean, to grow up uh, middle class and... <clears throat> Turn around and make billions and uh, employ God knows how many people. And then you're, how old is he, in his 70s? Yeah, he's, he's a real he is, And he, he can just spontaneously decide, you know what, I'm going to try to be president now. And I mean, when you're the serious yeah. contender, that, that's a black goal right there. <laughs> I would not call Buttigieg's fate something that I want you know, my people to aspire to. You know what, you're right. I'm going to defer to uh, your votes. <laughs> At least I'll give three-fifths of my vote to yours. To where, uh, okay, Buttigieg, you're deported for this episode. <laughs> or <laughs> just, uh, that's the thing about faking black people. So my viewers and listeners, <laughs> he had this, his campaign had email blasts to several uh, uh, black politicians and activists asking for their endorsement. But here's, but here's a twist. It said that if you don't want to be announced that you're endorsing Pete Buttigieg, reply to opt out <laughs> of this. Just, why? <laughs> Imagine coming up with an idea, and this is an idea. And not to mention that Bloomberg, he is just rolling in the dough uh, this election cycle. And if you work for Bloomberg, uh, you'll get three catered meals a day and, and the newest iPhone and, uh, and, and an Apple a laptop and just rolling in money. So, you oh, know, that's true. Yeah. I mean, technically, Bloomberg's, yeah, I think literally speaking, Bloomberg's put more money in African Americans' pockets than Buttigieg. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Probably there's just this campaign. Holy crap. I can't imagine how hard he must be <laughs> bending over to find black people to work for him. Yeah. So, uh, any uh, final thoughts? On. Yeah, well, uh, uh, on, uh, on the topic or on the. Uh, well, really anything. I mean, this um, is your people's month and it's the shortest month. So, let's a little bit, see. one day longer because of the leap year. Well, I'll try to make it bite sized and just hit every group we've talked about. All right. Um, on the Republican end, let's see, coordinating with us uh, black people, uh, for one, uh, either send me a, I don't know, two to three hundred grand a year stipend and I'll do it for you. But otherwise, <laughs> uh, basically, the thing the left is doing totally correct is branding. So actually step that up and uh, you got to reimage the party. And shoot, even just talking here in Texas uh, with that debacle with. Uh, Latinos for Trump and uh, the law cabinet Republicans. You really got to think through what the hell we as a party even is. Because, um, shoot, the way things are going, I, I might get inspired to just split the boat and make a black revolutionary party and take the Black Panthers 10 points and correct them to some libertarian thing. And that's it. It would basically be giving it over to the left if I got popular enough. But uh, you got to reform the party in some way that actually fits not so much uh, fits everyone in because we do need to be about some basic principles, but uh, anybody can hold those principles. So uh, we've got to be cognizant to that. Um, you know, some mega gay person can still be just as hardy about the Second Amendment and not having licensing restrictions. So if enough of those people to get together and make, I don't know, the law cabin Republicans disagreeing with them. And, oh, God, putting in writing that you're doing it because they're all gay and they're going to follow a gay agenda and corrupt our party. What the hell? That's Texas specific, but uh, yeah, I definitely don't see the uh, national Republicans stepping in on that one. Um, I mean, there's some um, national level Republicans, uh, such as that Dan Kernshaw. Oh, but, yeah, he, he did. Yeah. But um, and even, I mean, uh, like the actual RNC. Oh, the actual RNC. Of course. Like, like, I'd the, love an official statement for them saying, stop this or we'll cut your um, I mean, they're as, uh, they as much as backbone as the NRA. Yeah, and that's the part I hate. Honestly, Trump is the best, uh, I don't want to say model, don't copy exactly what he does, but uh, <laughs> the level of not caring uh, that he has when he feels he's right, we need to have about our principles. Yeah. And we don't have that. We care about being palatable and inoffensive. And, well, where to get you? And where was it about to get you before the exact opposite guy happened to win a primary with us? Um, to conservatives in general, I'd just say... Basically, 
in reaching out to us and being able to apply your principles that you should be having to black people. If you actually have conservative principles, you don't have any black targeted principles because you shouldn't believe in inherently targeting anyone. Um, so just be able to articulate why what you want uh, helps black people. So, uh, for example, reducing uh, regulations. Uh, right now, I'd have to pay about $10,000 in fees and taxes if I were to start a business and hire an employee. Um, that means I could go to the crappiest black neighborhood, and if I'm doing um, just well enough to pay somebody 10 bucks an hour, I could go take a kid off the block and show them a trade, but I got to factor in stuff to the government to do. Um, or s payments to the government, and I got to be able to pay them their cut before I can even touch them, because apparently not doing that, or doing that makes sure that I'm not exploiting them. But since I got to do that, I actually can't even hire him, so he's now he's at the glorious zero dollars an hour and still on the block. So that's just an example of a policy that would affect me as a business owner and affects all the people I'm not hiring, affects the neighborhood that I'm not bringing goods to, and uh, for you know the feelings people. That neighborhood has one less black business and therefore one less black role model to go after. But, uh, you know, they can turn on SoundCloud or YouTube and slang drugs. And, and that, that looks uh, like a good alternative when literally you can't live next to a better one. So basically think about any example like that. And every conservative policy you should be able to extrapolate. Um, the Black Panthers are an example for the Second Amendment. Um, there's God knows how many if they're first. So... Just think along those lines and actually do the job of advocating, especially with other conservatives, and take over the conservative or the Republican Party, maybe. Um, for Democrats, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty ticked at you guys. My, uh, like I said, my whole family is from Chicago, grew up there. Um, my little branch is the only one that broke away. I don't really remember when Chicago got to be Republican run. It's been a pretty good Democratic stronghold. Um, yeah, I, my chances of a dying spike if I go there. The uh, principles that you guys have really, I don't know, it's divisive. It doesn't help. Rethink your freaking um, positions. Actually, I don't even mind if you hold them, but actually entrench them with some sort of grounded fact with research. Not uh, what you think will happen, and therefore it's good. Um, and get off this freaking train we're on. Uh, there's definitely room for debate for counter-conservative views and all that, but uh, honestly, it's just extremism. And then uh, finally, just the left people in general, maybe not necessarily Democrats. Um, for most left people that I've met, they basically just have the general idea that they want good things to happen to everyone. They feel like that's not the case. And they had these, uh, they back the policies they do because they think that'll bring it about. They think there's some somewhat evil, selfish, conservative status quo, and that's not progress. And, you know, you quote stuff that you know damn well you didn't personally research, you just really believe is well grounded. Um, you'll talk about the 76% thing with women, you'll talk about how great uh, European healthcare is and why we need to copy it. No, and damn well, you never sat down and actually looked at, uh, you know, well, how expensive is healthcare in those places? Uh, why do their doctors keep coming to the U.S.? Why did Romania lose 50% of its freaking doctors in a 10-year period? And things like that. And, you know, you can research that and then debate about uh, what they did wrong and how we'll do it, but you're not even at that point yet. You're just talking about why it's all just pie in the sky, a good idea. Um, and probably the best modern right now example is Bernie Sanders with uh, student loan forgiveness, um, how that's good and all that, when really you're talking about one of the most regressive taxes in American history. You're saying, you know, your privileged ass should uh, get free college when uh, that poor inner city kid that you want to fight for, he, he didn't even go to college. He's lucky if he uh, went finished high school, according to you, but uh, you need to have your college paid for so you can better help him in some eventual future, even though his uh, non-collegiate uh, paycheck is going to go into a tax fund to pay for you. And, you know, the other, what is it, 20, maybe 25% of the population that has these 
degrees that they're going to pay for us. I mean, I benefit, so I won't sob in tears if uh, you want to pay for my, my college tuition and my law school uh, loans. That's sure. But I just acknowledge that we're screwing over working class, literally working class people who are going to be footing the bill and not getting the benefit that we got out of it. And that's just an example. And basically think about your foundations and the output of it. And finally, I'd say rarely, actually, I haven't heard anything pitched uh, policy-wise or politically speaking that's new. It's been tried somewhere either in the past or in another country. We, you should at least be aware of that. And across the board, we should be cognizant of what data there is out there for any of our points and try to let that guide our positions and our views and then advocate based on that. Um, and then take everything I just universally said, and uh, I'd say that should be the message we have, we black people need to tell each other and ourselves. And as a culture, it's a whole new discussion, but we got to shift internally um, because the government's not going to save us. We are the only people who are going to save ourselves. I personally thank God I had parents who saw how crappy it was up there and moved me here and I had the opportunities that I did. I am very sad that that's rare, though, and I think we've got to make it on ourselves that that shouldn't be rare. But uh, that, that five or whatever minutes, should, that's pretty much my closing, my last thoughts too, on that. Yeah. I'll, I'll just give it to y'all in another 30 seconds. If you're a white conservative, defend black gun owners, uh, su support free market policies that will enable more uh, black uh, entrepreneurs to get into business. And uh, for white liberals, stop being what you are. <laughs> but as far as serious answer is, uh, actually pra practice, practice what you pre preach and the consequences outweigh your good intentions. Uh, but uh, that's uh, it from us at the Minority Report. Uh, thank you kindly for watching and have a happy Black History Month. Oh, I will. <laughs> yeah, I should have got the regular, but I do have the fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs>